All right. Um, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're happy uh, to have our first distinguished lecture, uh, computer science distinguished lecture of the semester. And uh, our speaker today is Virgil Bleeger. Virgil comes to us uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, where he's a professor of electrical and computer engineering and also directs their spy lab uh, there. <coughs> he had been for many years until 2007 uh, a professor at the University of Maryland and uh, recently made the move to Carnegie Mellon. Um, he's got a long and distinguished career ahead of him and, and both behind him and ahead of him both <laughs> in um, uh, a lot of areas of, of computer security, um, some, some work in access control, uh, denial of service, uh, and uh, cryptographic protocols, uh, including what we'll hear about today. Um, he's been uh, a consultant to a number of companies and, and government uh, agencies, including Burroughs, IBM, uh, the NSA, and, um, and is currently serving on uh, Microsoft's Trusted Computing Advi Academic Advisory Board. Uh, he's been editor uh, of uh, a number of uh, journals, currently is editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Dependable and Secure Computing, and also uh, currently chair of uh, ACM SIGSAC, the Special Interest Group on Security Audit and Control. Uh, he received uh, the National Information Systems Security Award given by NIST and the NSA, and uh, a couple of best paper awards. Uh, okay, uh, well, <laughs> thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk about uh, adversary definitions in security and cryptographic protocols and their fragility. And of course, I have to define what I mean by an adversary and I'd have to define what I mean by fragility. And I will do so using uh, a number of examples. Uh, what I really mean is this. Uh, we have wonderful theory in cryptographic protocols, which, enable us to do, to do, which enables us to do formal proofs uh, of security properties. And uh, what we find is that when we use that theory in practice, uh, the results break down. And uh, uh, it turns out that they break down not because there is anything wrong with the theory uh, and not because there is anything wrong with the proofs of those protocols. Uh, but uh, they break down because in practice the adversaries that we have don't quite conform to the assumptions of the adversaries, the theory. And this has nothing to do with the inability of implementers to understand theory, uh, but it has something to do with the fact that technology changes in time and this gap between theory and practice uh, gives us this notion of fragility, and the gap cannot be bridged. In other words, it's something that we are going to live with forever. So those are some of the points that I like to make. Uh, consequently, we have to devote quite a bit of time in interpreting and reinterpreting theoretical results relative to the technologies that, uh, that come down in time. Okay, so, uh, so basically, uh, I'm paraphrasing on this first line something that Bob Morris, uh, this is the father of the famous Robert Morris, uh, uh, Bob said that uh, a system without a specification cannot be insecure. It can only be surprising. Actually, what I think is that a system without an adversary definition cannot possibly be insecure. It can only be astonishing. Um, and essentially what that means is that whenever we talk about uh, system security, we have to have an adversary definition because otherwise what we do is meaningless. Um, and uh, of course, um, what I'm going to do today is to uh, talk about adversary definitions and see how they are affected by technology and then give you two examples, uh, hopefully two examples, but certainly one of um, how one can attack protocols proven secure, correctly proven secure with good theory in practice. Um, and then uh, what I typically conclude is that good theory is really a medicine. It can be very effective in small doses, but only if you read the labels um, and the warnings. And, uh, and basically, just like medicine or drugs, um, you cannot use theory without clinical trials. In other words, we have to try the theory in various uh, practical, real-life environments before we determine that the theory is good. Just like we do with, with medicine. Otherwise, we just have an unuseful body of very interesting 
uh, intellectual uh, achievements. Okay, so, um, so how do you define an adversary? So the most general definition that I could find for an adversary is that an adversary is actually a set of attacks, uh, possibly in a computational model or in a computing model. And um, so, I'm sorry, so we have to figure out what an attack is. An attack is basically a goal uh, coupled with an adversary strategy or a model. And uh, a goal sometimes is called a threat or a break. Uh, the model is sometimes called a strategy, namely what to do to achieve that goal. And this pairing of uh, goal and strategy or goal and model was actually due to uh, Monin Aor, um, it's credited to him, uh, by uh, Bellario Desai, Poincheval, and Ragaway. So, uh, clearly, this notion of, atta uh, of an attack, I shall show you in a minute, is standard in, in cryptographic protocols and in cryptography in general. Now, the computing model uh, in cryptographic protocol always has a definition of the power of the adversary and the privileges the adversary has. So, uh, the power typically comes with the standard label. The, the adversary is a polynomially bounded probabilistic machine. And the privilege tells you what kind of oracles uh, for encryption and possibly decryption the adversary has and how those oracles are restricted. Okay, so that's basically what standard uh, cryptography defines as, as an adversary. Now, in practice, you have to worry about the execution strategies of the adversary. In other words, is the adversary bound by, not by the you know, polynomial bounds of the theoretical adversaries, but is he bound by the strategy that the adversary uh, imposes and by the privileges that the adversary model imposes as well. Okay, so here, is, here are some examples just to make sure that, uh, that you believe that I'm really using a crypto theory model structure here. So, for example, the goals in cryptography might be uh, to have an adversary that distinguishes between encryptions. So the an adversary may distinguish between, try to distinguish between whether the oracle that's used to do encryption uses a real string provided by the adversary or a random string, or uses a left uh, plain text or the right plain text which the adversary provided. And of course, a good uh, cryptographic scheme uh, would not enable the adversary to make those distinctions with more than negligible probability. Uh, another goal might be to forge authentic authentication tags and to forge real ciphertext, uh, possibly to impersonate users by guessing their passwords, uh, possible to force uh, secret key use. And of course, um, in order to launch this attack, the adversary has different types of strategies. So for example, the adversary in the weakest strategy might use verifiable plain text, predictable plain text, non-plain text, chosen plain text, chosen cipher text, and the attacks may be or may not be adaptive. Um, the adversary may in fact be a man in the middle, like in standard uh, models such as Dolevyao, and he could be everywhere, on every network link, could act as a legitimate party and could send and receive messages from anyone. So those are typical strategies that we assume uh, in the model, uh, coupled with the goals. Uh, and again, the power is a polynomially bounded probabilistic uh, adversary, and we specify the type of operations and how many operations, how fast, and how much storage the adversary uses. That's basically what we call power in all models. And privilege, as I mentioned before, access to oracles. What types of oracles do you give the adversary to encrypt? Possibly to decrypt as well, and what are the restrictions? In practice, however, um, the adversary does a number of interesting things. Uh, first, the adversary tries to find uh, oracles in real protocols. Uh, and then the adversary tries to figure out if those oracles can be accessed concurrently or only sequentially. And then the adversary tries to find out whether we can bypass the restrictions placed by the theoretical adversary. And that's what we are going to do today, is to try to bypass the restrictions placed by the theory adversary practice. Now, it turns out that the same strategy of defining the adversary works in software, uh, in, in particular in operating system penetration. 
So for example, if, um, if we want to modify, the goal is to modify internal kernel structures or to crash the system, what would we do? Well, one of the things we could do, we could invoke internal kernel functions which are not supposed to be invocable by a user interface. Uh, or if we want to access any user's file, we try to get root privileges or super user privilege in, a, in an operating system. And typically there is an intermediate goal there of generating possibly buffer overflows, although there are other intermediate strategies. And of course, the power of the, of the adversary here is limited. The adversary can only make system calls uh, and he only has seconds to execute those calls possibly. And the adversary is a registered but unprivileged user. Right. And in practice, now, the details, of course, are in practice. Namely, for example, the adversary to do to achieve goal one might, in fact, uh, invoke uh, in Unix something called copy set. This is an internal function which is not supposed to be available to the adversary that copies uh, data from one part of a memory to another inside the kernel. Um, to achieve two, to crash the system, the adversary might invoke the panic function, which is an internal kernel function, uh, which would cause the system to reboot, and might do that repeatedly. And in fact, what we found uh, in the system that I helped design and build, um, we found 38 of, uh, out of 110 system calls in, in Xenix, which is a version of Unix, enabled the adversary to actually invoke panic and reboot the system. And out of those, there's 15 independent paths through the kernel to do so. Right. So, so essentially, in order to block those attacks in practice, uh, what we had to do, we had to do real code analysis and to look at all adversaries' paths and strategies through the kernel. It wasn't sufficient to do proofs based on the abstract <coughs> properties of our model. We actually had to do the analysis on code. Um, the access to get root privilege, you might invoke the remove dir with a, uh, a frame parameter that over, overwrites a buffer uh, and modifies the return address, and you'd run with super user privileges your own code. And the game was over. We did that after uh, Robert Morris's attack. Uh, we actually built this automated tool to find some of these problems, and this was done the tool was completed in 91, and it was the first theory of penetration that, uh, that was ever proposed. And uh, Robert Morris told me that don't spend your time with a kernel. You'll find maybe four or five flaws. Look at system processes. So we started looking at system processes, not just finger D, but removed it and make it and the rest of them, and we found a lot of flaws and quite a few buffer overflows. So we published some of them in 1992. Okay, so this is supposed to tell you that this frame framework of defining adversaries is actually general. It doesn't apply just to cryptography. It also applies to uh, systems engineering and software analysis. So what do I mean by fragility and robustness of definitions? So the first thing that you notice in cryptography is that the result of uh, many of the proofs that you do uh, end up being uh, a statement like the advantage of the adversary in attacking a protocol is negligible. And there is a formal definition of the advantage. Then when you look at the result, you find that the advantage is taken as a maxi maximum uh, quantifier in front of it, which really means that uh, the statement is true, the negligibility of the adversary's advantage is taken over all polynomial adversaries. In other words, that uh, the definition assumes absolutely nothing about the adversary's strategy. Well, uh, what it says is that, that for any of the adversary strategies that we listed, namely uh, chosen plain text, uh, non plain text, adaptive chosen plain text, chosen cipher text, for all those strategies, this negligibility statement holds. Very powerful thing. So, so long as we establish this independence of the adversary strategy, we have a very general result that we call very robust. I call it very robust. So this is a, 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 a statement that, that the theory gives us. And whenever we get such results, we are extremely happy. Um, 
And of course, there is a principle called the arbitrary adversary principle, which is actually a goal, which says that the security must be guaranteed for any adversary strategy within the class of adversaries of the, having a specified power. So for any adversary which is polynomially bounded, probabilistic, of course, adversary, um, that statement, the advantage of the adversary is negligible would hold. So this is really a wonderful principle to, hold, to have in mind that it's obviously a goal that's largely unattainable in practice. Because in practice, we always have dependencies on the adversary strategy, and that's what I want to do next. But before I do that, let me tell you where these dependencies come from and why they'll be with us forever. So uh, I try to characterize what's important about technology and changes in technology. And it's very difficult to come up with abstract characterizations. But I'll give you one, and there are probably many more. Okay, so one abstract characterization says it's about the power of the adversary. So we have that Moore's law, which says that the processing power doubles roughly every 18 months. And of course, that's changing now, but it's been with us for a while, so it's still a good example to cite. We also have other doubling effects that, that affect the adversary's power, like the memory doubles every year, uh, meaning for the same cost, fiber optics, websites, and so on. And these are largely accounted for in our uh, definition of the adversary. Uh, what happens is, is that we are not accounting for the details of the execution strategy. So essentially here we have Metcalfe's law, which says that uh, the value of the network grows quadratically with the number of connections or the number of parties. So the question is, can we actually exploit this to construct adversaries that behave according to Metcalfe's law? Okay? Or to exploit large-scale large concurrency? Okay, so I'll try to give you an example of that. But before I do that, let's take our polynomially bounded adversary and look for strategies inside this class um, that would enable, for example, the adversary to succeed uh, with power of two of the number of connections, number of users. In other words, the adversary would take advantage of the network effect, Metcalfe's network effect. Or uh, the adversary would, in fact, succeed with the probability proportional to the number of users or connections involved in the attack. Okay? And, uh, of course, we have a not, uh, rest of the adversaries are ordinary in our partition here. Right? So there is a class of ordinary adversaries, network adversary, and concurrent adversary. Okay, so what do you notice about the theoretical results obtained to date? Well, if you look at the formal adversary definition, which is the Yao, or the computational adversary for encryption and standard encryption and, and decryption protocols and random or random model, is that this, these adversaries are probably ordinary. In other words, if there is anything, if you find any flaw in the encryption protocol uh, that two parties run, it doesn't matter if you have two or 20 or 200. You don't need two or 20 or 200, you just need two. So the adversary's advantage doesn't grow in any way with the number of parties involved. And that's a provable statement. In fact, uh, Michianzio proved this. Um, and that's true also for the Dolevial and the computational adversary. Okay. Now, there are other adversaries which are concurrent but not network. So the Byzantine adversaries are concurrent adversaries but not network adversaries. The success doesn't depend quadratically with the number of parties. Okay. Uh, so now let's, let's look at an example of a concurrent adversary at work. So what uh, the class of examples that I have here is the so-called password authenticated key exchange protocols. So the structure of these protocols is as follows, and all of them behave in the same way. Uh, you have a key exchange protocol between two parties, and at the end of the key exchange, or perhaps interleaved with a key exchange, you have an authentication exchange so that not only you generate the same key based on a shared password, but uh, you also know who's at the other end. Okay. So there are maybe half a dozen of such protocols in the literature, and uh, most of them have correct proofs of security in either the standard model or the random oracle model. So there's nothing wrong with them from a theoretical point of view. Okay. All right, so, <coughs> so essentially that's a structure. 
and we don't need to look at the details of the exchange because they all fall into the same genetic structure. And uh, now, uh, failures in the protocol are counted as login failures, either by incorrect authenticated messages at the end uh, or by uh, timeouts. In other words, if the server challenges the client with an authenticated message and the client doesn't, pick, doesn't have the right password, uh, he will even either send an incorrect authentication message, obviously he'll send a guess, right, because he doesn't have the password, uh, and he tries to send many, many guesses, or he would be silent. And after a while, the server would time out and count this as an authentication failure, of course. All right, so that's what happens with login failures. Now, the, in the adversary definition here, um, we um, characterize what does it mean to verify a password guess, online or offline. And all these protocols give you a bound on the adversary's advantage, which has two components. One is, and the one that interests us, is the number of queries or online attacks that the adversary can, be, can, can carry out, or the number of password guesses, if you want, Q, divided by the size of the password space, plus a negligible advantage which corresponds to the adversary's advantage in breaking the password offline, which has to be negligible. This one would have to be negligible as well, but we can adjust this one. Right? The other one is basically a, a, a very concrete bound. So the question is, how do we actually count this, uh, the bound on Q? It turns out that in all practical protocols nowadays, the bound on Q is bound on by login, is provided by login failures. You cannot possibly provide that bound by login attempts, because if you do so, you can cause massive denial of service. So for example, I deliberately send a number of attempts to your account, and of course, if I exceed a limit, uh, the account would be locked, and you won't be able to use it. So you contact the system administrator, your password is reset, and I do exactly the same thing. So forever you'll not be able to, to log in. And you won't know who I am, because there is no authentication in the internet. I can spoof anybody's address, right? So consequently, we, what we have to do, we have to count the, the failures, not the, of login. We have to count them after we try to authenticate, not the attempts, okay. So, uh, so essentially, that's what happens in practice. So here is an attack that works against um, one subclass of the packet protocols that works as follows. We have the authenticated key exchange, uh, which is denoted here by PACI. And in this class of protocols, um, what happens is the server challenges the client with the authentication message first. But in this attack, the client verifies his own password locally. He figures out if the authentication message can be verified locally, and it can be by decryption or encryption, and then never sends a reply back. So the server instance which was created for, for this client, and by the way, these are clients that can be generated concurrently, and these are server instances that reply to each client. Uh, the server instance starts the timer and it times out after a delta interval of 500 milliseconds to 5,000 seconds, okay? But what the adversary does starts a new client, a new server instance is generated, um, and again, he gets challenged, no reply, he tests the password locally. So what happens is that uh, eventually Q would be exceeded, the bound on the number of trials, but by the time Q is exceeded, the adversary verified uh, a number of password guesses that vastly exceeds Q. Q is typically between two and five, as you probably experience yourself. Yet, it turns out that in this period, in, in this class of protocols, you can verify 600, 500, 400 guesses. Okay. So, so clearly what we've got here, we've got the problem of uh, this gap between these protocols which are proven secure with this exchange and the fact that you can exceed the bounds which theory tells you that you cannot. 
All right. So now the question is, how bad is this? Well, so we did uh, some experiments with two of these uh, uh, protocols, which are proven secure in the standard model and one in the random oracle model, with a login failure uh, limit of five and a time between 500 and 5,000 milliseconds. And uh, you notice that some of this, uh, some of this uh, excess trials come to about 500 or over 500 uh, and with a minimum of about 150 when in fact the limit had to be 5. Okay? So, so these are real attacks against two real protocols which were proven secure in practice and gave you a bound of 5 over n. And n was picked by, uh, by the whatever password space you used. All right. Okay, so now let's fix this. So the problem you might say correctly is, well, uh, why have the server challenge the, the client first? Why don't you ask the client to pre-authenticate? Right? I mean, you could have an exchange which is initiated by the, by the client, not by the server, and that will solve the problem. And indeed, it will remove this attack. And in fact, we do have... Um, we do have at least a couple of protocols that start out with the client being pre-authenticated. One of them uh, was published by Jonathan Katz, uh, Rafael Ostrovsky, and Moti Jung at Europe in 2001. And of course, Kerberos 5 requires a pre-authenticated message, even though Kerberos 5 does not, is not a password-authenticated key exchange protocol, but it comes close, and it does require pre-authentication nowadays. Okay, so in this case, um, the authenticated message is initiated by the client at the end of the packet exchange, and the server provides a reply. So essentially, the uh, client cannot repeatedly fool the server because the server counts, presumably, or the server instances count the instances of, of failed replies. Okay, so the problem here is different, and there is a problem with this protocol as well. The problem is that in the internet nowadays, just like in the in fairly substantial size distributed systems such as those based on Kerberos and DCE, uh, the registry servers are replicated. And they are replicated for two reasons, the standard two reasons. One is robustness, and the other one is responsiveness. So essentially, in, in, if you look at Kerberos, you'll see that there is a, a master site that does updates and reads, and it has slave sites, typically two of them, possibly more, but typically two that allow clients to read only registry information. So essentially what you've done here, you replicated uh, user account information, including passwords, and that bound queue. And what happens is that uh, this updates that, for example, server instances create, the updates to queue, failed uh, login update, would have to propagate from, say, the master or from any one of the slaves, would have to propagate to all the others. And that propagation is not instantaneous. And the very fact that you have, uh, that you allow uh, clients to read uh, replica information would mean that these other servers could read uh, the bound and pass the bound while the update that overshots the bound propagates. Clearly this is not uh, 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 as potent an attack as the previous one, but what this shows you, and here is uh, how this attack, I mean the results of this attack, it shows you that uh, a protocol which is proven correct, with great theorems, uh, has the bound given by the theory overshot by, in this case, only about 25, as opposed to 500 or 600. And, and this typically would be set to 5. Or, as IEEE does for packet protocols, IEEE standard now, there's a packet standard that uh, sets that to 1. I think two, 1 or 2. So, so essentially, what you notice here that even if you fix the previous problem, uh, you have these dependencies on the behavior of the adversary. So you might say, okay, well, why don't we fix that? Why don't we just make uh, 
to eliminate the delays, we simply have a server, a single server with replicas behind it, and the replicas are not readable by clients. Essentially, if you do that uh, in the internet, you'll probably not log in very often at peak times, because you'll have minute waits to log in, not orders of half a second, or five seconds, or ten seconds. Uh, because you might get, for example, request rates of, say, 100 requests per second. And to, uh, to get the lock and to update and receive a reply in the end, that might be of the order of uh, 500 milliseconds. Okay? So essentially, you cause enormous waves. Now, if you distribute this and you say, okay, well, let's make this a distributed system to be more responsive, but to impose serializability of the, the updates to queue, implement a mutual exclusion protocol across these multiple servers. And there is at least a couple of, of good ones, like Sigma, for example, that Microsoft has. Uh, unfortunately, if you do that, you serialize all accesses, not just accesses to an account. Uh, and again, you'd be causing a, a huge performance problems in login in terms of user visible log, uh, login delays of minutes as opposed to seconds. Okay, so it turns out that the solution to this problem, <coughs> the synchronization delay attack, is not so easy in practice, although it looks easy in theory. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why uh, theorists have not, not really looked at it. And, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that even if you can fix this, there are, mo in most practical instances, you cannot. So, uh, so consequently, this shows the dependency of the result, the theoretical result, on the uh, practical adversary as opposed to the theoretical adversary. Okay, so now, when I mention that this gap between theory and practice is fundamental or inherent and will be with us forever, what did I mean and what proof do I have? Okay, so what I meant is this. Uh, neither of these two attacks, namely this one, nor this one, nor the next one, would have occurred 20 years ago. So in other words, if we take the same theory and apply it to the centralized systems of 20 years ago, the small-scale local area networks 20 years ago, none of this would materialize. So obviously, something happened in the last 20 years. Right. And one of the things that happened was that we moved to the Internet when you now have large-scale client-server computations, when in fact uh, servers are, server instances are dynamically generated for clients, and of course server instances access back-end machines and, and databases such as uh, registries, possibly replicated registries. This was not a model that we had 20 years ago in practice. And certainly we didn't have large-scale concurrency. Now in the last example, just to show you how, uh, what, what technology does, and is uh, essentially the same attack, uh, uh, the same kind of attack, uh, we call it a multi-domain attack, in which the, the, uh, the uh, adversary starts computations in multiple domains where the user or the account uh, the users of the same account, of course, might have the same password. So, for example, uh, you have uh, your uh, passwords for your financial institutions, uh, investment institutions, and you have maybe two or three of those, and uh, maybe a healthcare institution. And suppose that all of them use one of these packages, and you choose the same password. So what would happen is that the client now la launches con concurrent attacks against those accounts in different institutions. Do you think they are going to synchronize the failure accounts across institutions? Of course not. Well, this would not have happened 20 years ago because we did not have, 20 years ago, we didn't have multi-domain or multi-realm systems. We only had small-scale systems. So, uh, and by the way, Inside each domain, you can launch the previous two attacks. So consequently, now you have an n squared dependency on the number of parties the adversary uses. So you have your network adversary, not just a concurrent adversary. 
okay? because you depend in two dimensions. You depend on the domain dimension and you depend on the number of clients you have and password trials inside each domain. Okay? So once again, I want to say there is absolutely nothing wrong with the theory. There is nothing wrong with the proofs. These are all protocols. The three of them are all protocols that have correct proofs. Yet something breaks in practice. And what I claim is that, that the break is due to the uh, interpretation of the adversary model in practice, which shows that the adversary models are fairly fragile. They can break if you don't interpret them correctly. And secondly, that these breaks also occur in time for the same theory, simply because technology changes. Okay, so don't expect that magic will happen in the next uh, 100 years, which will tell us that we can apply the theory directly, uh, and we don't have to revisit the application of theory. So what we did here, we, if we applied this theory 20 years ago, it would have worked fine, but 20 years later it would not. So essentially we have to revisit the applicability of the theoretical results in, in practical environments. All right, so now I have uh, a second example uh, to show the effect of network, network adversaries at, at work. If you have any questions about the first one or any comments, now it's a good time to ask, because otherwise I'll quickly go to the second one. Yeah? Uh, maybe you're going to get to this later. But, uh, can the definition of the adversary be extended to cover these cases? Well, practical cases. Practical cases, yeah. but they, they appear to me as a, as a practitioner, okay, I'm, my, my job is as a right. system administrator, uh, they appear to me as a, as a practitioner to be still be fairly, uh, fairly theoretical. Um, uh, so that it, is, is there a, a sharp boundary between practice and theory, or, or can these things be worked back into the, into the theory? Okay, so, the, so basically, uh, what we did, was we did exactly that, and uh, that's uh, a bunch of co-authors of this work. And we basically redefined the advantage of the adversary so that we can now account for the instantiation of the theory in the different environments. So essentially, the, the new model that we have for PACIS um, does away with this attack simply by doing what uh, Katz, Ostrowski, and Young did, namely do pre-authentication always doesn't matter what protocol you have. You have to pre-authenticate the user, period. No, no, the model would now say that, which it didn't before. So we, we fall into this category. And in this category of attack, what we say, the advantage of the adversary now depends on things like the number of trials that you could do within that synchronization window, if that window is non-zero. So then, what you can do is to adjust your password space. So if you as a designer know that you can have, in that delay period, you can have 25 trials, you increase your password space appropriately so that 25 over the new password space would reduce to the advantage that's desired. So we had to change the definition of the adversary advantage. So we changed the theory, basically. Not that much, but we did. So in order to account for this. And of course, in this case, uh, we provide warning labels, <laughs> right? Remember, medicine comes as warning labels. The warning labels here says never use the same password in multiple domains if you find that they use the same packing protocol or similar protocols that could be attacked, similarly. So, uh, and, and, and that's important, obviously, because this adds a new dimension to the attack. We couldn't fix this in the model, right? I mean, yes, we could have said, well, this applies to multiple domains, but the easiest thing to do is to just tell, tell people, don't, don't try this and don't, don't use the same password because you don't know what these guys are using. They might use a standard IEEE certified protocol. That's very likely they are. Yeah. So, right. Okay. Um, so the second example... Uh, is in a very different area. Uh, in 2002, this graduate student of mine and I uh, looked at a very different problem. The problem was key redistribution in sensor networks. 
So we came up with a scheme for Kibri distribution, which was based on uh, key collisions. So the way the scheme worked was simple. We predistributed a small set of keys to each sensor in a network of, say, 10,000 nodes, which are randomly distributed because we are interested in this uh, uh, independence of topology and distribution. And, and what we did uh, to figure out which sensors have in the neighborhood have the same key so that they could communicate uh, via encrypted messages, we ask each sensor to broadcast the encryption of a constant to all the rest. So each one of the recipients would encrypt that constant with their own key and they do the intersection and find a, a, a collision of ciphertext, which we called key collisions. And that's how they discover how uh, keys would be shared. So the primitive that we had was this. Suppose that each node has uh, k distinct uh, values, namely these values are all uh, the, the ciphertext representing the constant encrypted with different keys. And we made sure that the ciphertext were all different. In other words, if there is a collision, we discarded it. Uh, and each node did this. Um, and at the end of this process, uh, we obviously had not just pairwise sharing, but we had a certain confidence in the connectivity of the graph. So it turns out that a number of people said, well, you don't get connectivity because these are not random graphs. And if you think of them as random graphs, which we did, they won't be random graphs. It turns out that uh, about three months ago, um, Jagan Markovsky at the University of Maryland actually proved uh, a, uh, a theorem about this scheme. And they showed that, in fact, uh, the probability that you don't have connectivity between some nodes is zero if some constant in this relation defined here was less than one, and one if the constant was less than one. So basically what this says is that uh, connectivity is an emergent property, so it's a zero-one law. If you uh, dimension this list relative to the entire network size properly and relative to the, the, uh, the space of the ciphertext and the keys properly, then you get this zero on law and you'll get connectivity. Okay, so then all of a sudden I realized maybe about six months ago that this property could be used for constructing attacks against encryption schemes which are proven secure. Okay, so, so basically the attack would, be, would work as follows. And by the way, um, the way I would determine that, uh, that I have a key, of course, is the way I mentioned. I look at the ciphertext that I receive, um, and I encrypt uh, the constant in my keys, and I check for collisions in, in the ciphertext. If I have a collision, I have the same key. So for example, if uh, this ciphertext here collides with this, then the key which corresponded to this encryption uh, would be essentially this key. But of course, you have to have a certain kind of encryption to do that. Okay, so, uh, so what, what we did was actually something very similar. Suppose that you have an adversary that encrypts um, a constant in lots and lots of keys. And I'll show you the real numbers, which are possible nowadays. So the adversary pre-computes this list of encrypted constants. Then what the adversary does, the adversary listens to uh, communication over the internet because the adversary knows that in the internet there are maybe 120 million sites that use this standard protocol that happens to encrypt that constant and will relax them to, to move from the constant to non plain text, I mean to uh, predictable plain text in a minute. But Basically, we have a bunch of nodes in the internet which become unsuspecting or unwitting oracles for the adversary. Why? Because they use roughly a protocol which encrypt that constant which the adversary knows 
in their own keys. So for example, we have a site I, which encrypts uh, R, does R encryptions with R different keys over time of the same constant. And you have N H of the sites. Okay, so if you put the sites together, they would act as one of my lists in sensor predistribution. Okay? Now remember that these uh, encryptions here are uh, generating ciphertext which are drawn from this pool, just like in the case of my uh, sensor networks, without replacement. No collisions. So how do I know that there are no collisions here or no collisions among these nodes? Well, it turns out that they aren't because these are small sets of numbers. And you don't get anywhere close to the birthday bound. They're nowhere close to the birthday bound. So the probability of collision is absolutely negligible. Okay? So essentially what the other side does, it simply collects, listens to the internet and collects all this material. Of course, it will take a long time, possibly a year. But at the end of that process, you take the ciphertext, you search them against this list, and you'll find the collision with probability that's proportional with kn squared, namely this is the size of the list, divided over pn, uh, which is the size of this port. Okay? So this is equivalent if r is of the same order as, uh, as n, equivalent to n squared kn over pn, which is our network at this side of time. The, the Metcalf law at work here. Yeah. So now, uh, how, how bad is this and what, who's affected by this? Well, first of all, let me just show you that um, that it's possible to have such collisions. And in fact, the reason why this happens is that uh, if you do encryption, say, at a reasonable level in the, in the protocol stack, you are going to encrypt headers. Right? So you are going to encrypt possibly application headers in TCP messages. And these application headers and some of the application data do have uh, known constants and predictable values. By the way, the attack that I mentioned, uh, I'll, I can show you any time that works with values which are predictable but not necessarily constant as well. And, and this has been known, by the way, for a long time. So, for example, in, uh, Steve Bellovin points out, and Harry Hinsley actually told Steve and I, uh, Hinsley is one of the people who provided all the radio intercepts to Turing and to the other people at Bletchley, and wrote this book uh, called uh, The History of Bletchley Park uh, in 1993. And what he pointed out is that in the German protocols, there is a constant called officier. In the header, there is always the word officier because these crypto machines were only used by officers and they had to write that they were officers. Right? They couldn't send a message without writing that they were officers. So that was a constant. And another one was, another constant was that when there is clear weather in the Atlantic, uh, they would uh, uh, broadcast uh, a constant message, never changed, uh, called weather report German bright. So that was it. <laughs> now, we have stand-up padding, by the way, in protocols nowadays. And when you pad, you always have to pad in, in, in typical padding. Of course, you can do other fancy things. But, but that means that if you have messages which are integ an integral number of blocks, they'll always have the same pad at the end. Uh, people changed that a little bit recently. But that's uh, so we have other sources of that. Predictable values in TCP headers, again, Steve Bellovin pointed out that you have about 88 out of 128 bit of a block constant in IP tunneling, uh, even more predictable text. Okay, so now what's affected by this? So one uh, encryption scheme or protocol that's affected by this is the counter mode encryption, which is actually a standard that is proven secure. Uh, and if you use it um, with a message authentication scheme that uses a different scheme and is secure, you can provide an authenticated encryption scheme, which is also in CCA to secure. So essentially what you, what you see here is that if counter mode uses a constant, if the protocol that is, uses counter mode uses a constant, uh, 
happening here. So if the product of this is a constant uh, somewhere, and say some constant block x, uh, you are going to get this constant across multiple keys for each instantiation of the node. So if you have 70 million sites, which is roughly what Facebook would have, using this protocol, with that constant, you get an awful lot of known uh, plain text encrypted in different keys. This appears also in other uh, protocols. In fact, uh, this is a real big problem that we have not really solved at all. Problem of encrypting constants or printing double text. So, uh, so essentially, now what kind of numbers do we get? And by the way, I listed here a number of a number of uh, standards that are affected. So this is CCM, which is counter mode, and CBC MAC, of course, with two different keys. Um, and you can have all sorts of other standards that GCM, which is also affected, it's with a new standard, and so on. So now, uh, how serious is this problem in practice? Okay, so how many unsuspecting sites would you have? Well, say you have between 2 to the 24 and 2 to the 26 sites. This is essentially about 10% of the number of internet hosts uh, at the end of this year. Right. Or you have uh, membership in social networks. MySpace is roughly 2 to the 27, Facebook is 2 to the 26, and of course 2 to the 26 is the size of the Chinese Communist Party membership, so that's a social network too. Uh, if they encrypt with the same protocol and encrypt constants, they are in trouble. Um, and in fact, that constant would grow to 2 to the 27.5 uh, by the end of 2011. R. R is the number of different keys that you use per site, namely the number of different sessions a site starts. Right? Each session would have a separate key. Um, that's roughly between 2 to the 24 and 2 to the 28 easily. So for example, if you use this in SSL, you'd have uh, between 2 to the 26 and uh, 2 to the 38 connections per year. So you use two, that many keys, different keys per year. Um, now, the adversary has to produce that list, right, against which he compares the encryption of the constant. How fast can the adversary compute in that list? Well, the adversary can compute clearly between 2 to the 48 and 2 to the 54 encryptions. This is based on uh, special hardware like 4 Helion Giga cores or uh, lots of max if you use the four cores at full speed. So 64, 2.6 gigahertz max with four cores. Okay? So essentially what you do, you get this number, 2 to the 54 constants encrypted per year. The bigger problem is storage. So the storage that you need uh, would be between 4 and 2 to the 56 petabytes, which costs the cost of next year's Cost four would cost about half a uh, half a million dollars to about thirty two million dollars in two thousand nine dollars, uh, but it will cost by two thousand twelve between a hundred thousand and four million. Okay. Uh, the other problem is the communication. To transfer this amount of say four petabytes will take at full speed TCP at full speed about twenty days to about half a year. Okay, so what do you get? At the end of this attack, which is certainly plausible, you actually broke a protocol which is proven secure. Could we have done it 10 years ago? And by the way, breaking it means breaking it with non-negligible probability. You don't have to break it with probability one, right? The theory says that all the breaks that we do uh, that at the size advantage in breaking those, or the probability of breaking those, is bounded by epsilon, but epsilon is a negligible quantity in the security parameter. 
the security parameter is basically the length of the key, right? Or the length of the block and the length of the key. So, uh, so essentially, uh, what you get here, you get pr the probability of discovery of some honest user secret keys is between one in a billion and one in a million. This is certainly non-negligible. When in fact, uh, the length of the key is 128 bits, so and the length of the block is 128 bits. Now, would this attack have been possible? Uh, in 1997, when counter mode was proven secure? And the answer is no. As a matter of fact, in 1996, Biham gave a key collision attack uh, where he showed that you can go to the birthday bound, you get essentially probability, uh, probability one here, right? But for this, which is a 56 bit key. So, uh, clearly, with AES, you're not supposed to be able to get these collisions. Uh, how do I know that you're not supposed to? Well, I looked at the NIST standards about how long this 128-bit key would last and, and how long keys would last in general. And the standard, which is, of course, uh, done in 2007, so it's recent, shows that an 80-bit key should be good enough by 2010. Um, and according to this attack, you have a deficit of minus 28 bits in that key by 2010. Uh, 120, 112 bits, which is, of course, uh, uh, triple this with uh, uh, two keys, that should last till 2030. That gives you four bit of security according to this attack. And uh, AES is supposed to be a minimum of 128 bits, but if you have 128 bits, it will last you beyond 2030. And this is clearly not the case. Okay. Why? Because the adversary they assumed was exactly the adversary that Bellar and Ragaway and the Cyan Jokipi assumed in 1997 when they proved the security of counter mode. So what adversary did they assume? They assumed that there is an adversary that's given an encryption oracle, and the adversary can encrypt anything he wants, including constants. I mean, the oracle can encrypt anything the adversary wants. Well, okay, left or right security or real or random security. The adversary couldn't tell, couldn't distinguish the encryptions, which is the master property that gives you all secrecy properties in cryptography. So that's the the the, the Bounds which are derived here uh, were really intimately uh, related to that single oracle attack. Whereas what I showed here is that now in the internet uh, we have many, many oracles. And these are oracles that encrypt constants or predictable values. So, uh, for example, the R that I assume here could be 2 to the 28, the N that I assume here could be 2 to the 26, uh, and the K that I have there could be 2 to the 54. And with those numbers, you get the probability of a key collision, namely a break of that proven protocol, is 1 in a million. Okay, because you have this N squared here. And this is not a birthday attack, it's just a straight key collision attack. So you don't have to go to the birthday bound. Uh, you couldn't get nowadays to the birthday bound. Maybe 10, 15 years from now, you can go to create 2 to the 64 uh, encryptions during one year. And then you have to stop. Uh, you have to change the block size. We are not there yet. But the problem is that we have to change the key sizes. In other words, that, uh, that this key size is that that uh, NIST claims would last for uh, until 2030, it's not going to be the case. They have to double the key size within probably the next two years. And that comes from nowhere in the theory. Okay, so uh, by the way, I have other examples of this phenomenon of uh, network attacks or n squared attacks, if you want, or attacks that follow Metcalfe's uh, uh, law. Uh, but these are two of the, the, the ones that, uh, that I came up with recently. Um, so, uh, 
so essentially what I wanted to point out is that um, that we really have to rethink this gap between theory and, and, and practice that theorists cannot say uh, that practitioners don't understand how to apply theory uh, because theory has to be reapplied as technology changes. So this long-lasting proofs, long-lasting results which are absolutely very good and fascinating, uh, we have to reinterpret them in time. Uh, so, so the gap is going to be the theory and practice is going to be inherent. It's going to be with us forever. So this is not a matter of practitioners making mistakes. At the same time, practitioners should demand, demand of theorists a warning label on theory. I think it's only fair. <coughs> and should demand what I call clinical trials. That before we advertise the results of the theory, we actually have to apply them uh, in a bunch of current technologies. Just like medicine goes to clinical trials before it's actually foisted upon us by pharmaceutical companies. So, uh, so this analogy, of course, may or may not be uh, uh, accurate, but I think it captures what, what we want to do here. It captures the fact that we have to give interpretations of the theory, practical interpretation, and to test those interpretations in practice before we actually claim that the theory is good. Because otherwise we just stay on the theory plane and we cannot claim applicability in practice. Okay. So once again, nothing wrong with the theory. The theory is great, as a matter of fact, and I use a lot of these things myself. And I do, do them all the time in class. I teach an applied cryptography course, and I'd say 75% of it is reduction proof <laughs> of various kinds. So you get absolutely fascinating results, but then when you try to apply them, it's a different world. And uh, by the way, you can't get that with straight security results. So one of the things that I did in the 80s, I looked at three, three applications of the infamous Bell and Lapagula model in three different operating systems, one of which I helped design. And we got three different set of security results. One of them was Baltics, by the way, uh, the AIM project, which is between 73 and 76 at MIT. And the other one is COMP, the Secure Communication Pro Pro Processor, the Hannibal produced. And the other one was Secure Xenix or Trusted Xenix. Same model, same formal model, three different operating systems, three different security results. So clearly, the differences came in the details of the operating system interfaces and in the details of the interpretation of the theory results. And, and I think we should pay attention to that a lot more than in the past. Uh, meaning both theorists and practitioners uh, would need to do that. Okay, I'm essentially done. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yes, wait. memory trade-offs. Uh, that essentially gives you bounds like two-thirds of the uh, length of the key. That's the effective number of bits that you have. This is a much more powerful attack than that. So there is no, it's a different attack altogether. It's very, very actually very similar not to Hellman's attack, but it's si very similar to Biham's attack from 1996 and 2002. Although he, he look for the birthday bounds, and if you apply his attack, if you go with his attack to the birthday bound, uh, you will not be able to do it with what you do here. But you don't have to go that far. So I would, I'm the first one to admit that this is not a novel attack, um, but it's a novel way or a new way to show that that attack is practical in the internet with this type of collisions. 
okay, that you can collect those collisions in, in a real protocol. Uh, he didn't go to the details, but it's the same conceptual idea. That's why I want to make sure that he gets credit up front. Those are his two LEB on 96 and 2002. Now, your second question was, um, uh, let's see if I remember it. Your second question was about the, the uh, parallel attack which was done uh, by the Electronic uh, yeah, Frontier Foundations. Okay. Yeah. Now, what, that attack would not work here. That attack does not work against AES. Essentially what the attack did at the time, uh, you encrypt a constant uh, in, in a key. Right? You don't know the key, but you know the constant. So you're given the ciphertext. So now what you do, you decrypt that constant, brute force, with different keys, and eventually one decryption will match your constant. Right? So, so essentially, that's a brute force attack. It's not a key collision attack. And if you repeated that attack for AES, that attack is not even close to succeeding. Uh, because there is no technology now or envisioned for the next 10 years that would allow the kind of massive parallelism that you need to do uh, to search half on the average, half of the key space of AES. That's 2 to the 127. Remember, that's not a birthday attack. Key collision attacks are from the class of birthday attacks. This attack here is not a birthday attack because you don't go to the birthday bound. But it's a collision attack, just like burst attack. So it's a different beast from the EFF. Yeah. yeah. I think the difference is like you should have your searching for one particular key. You were happy with colliding with any any of the two or twenty six or twenty six keys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why the power is right. So that's where I get my n squared factor, which makes this uh, powerful, right? which allows me to to uh, to, to compute very easily the, the probability of success below, much below the birthday bound. By the way, the birthday attacks here are not effective. Uh, yeah. Um, so in terms of the clinical trials, is there a, a set of uh, rules or uh, strategies or uh, maybe a theory model that tells us what to do in order to have a comprehensive clinical trial so that uh, you know, in the face of ever-evolving adversary, we ha will carry out a reasonable good job of capturing the, the threat. Because uh, if we do a very limited attack model, a very limited clinical trial, that will be not very useful. Anyway. Right. Uh, that's a, an excellent question, and thank you for asking it. I forgot to mention, so what do I mean by the clinical trial? What kind of adversaries do I assume? So first of all, what I claim is that we have to look at network adversaries. These are adversaries whose probability of success uh, grow quadratically with the square root of the parties involved. In other words, we, we cannot look at simply at the adversary power in a computing model. We have to look at adversary strategies. And the one way to characterize abstractly the evolution of technology and of the strategies is to go to this kind of law. Right. So, uh, so provided that in your clinical trials envision an adversary like <coughs> this, you have some degree of confidence that you did more than you did classically. And also, of course, um, you have to look at the other large-scale effects, which we haven't so far, which are the effects of large-scale concurrency. And the, the computational model that you now have in the Internet which differ from the model that you had 10 and 20 years ago. So if you're asking me what kind of clinical trials would I do, I do uh, I'd construct adversaries in these two categories because what we've got so far have all been ordinary adversaries. Uh, that's basically, so they've been all in this category. And these are ordinary. They are, by the way, the results are extraordinary with those <laughs> adversaries. The results in cryptography are great. I mean, in fact, this has been the most successful pieces of security research. So, uh, so I always try to remember this footnote. <laughs> yes, they are ordinary, but that doesn't mean that they are bad. 
It's just that we shouldn't rely only on this. We should try some of the uh, some of the network and concurrent adversaries. But yeah. <coughs> but, ha but I mean, you you still get no way of knowing that there might not be two new kinds of adversaries that would result from kinds of technology like a quantum adversary. So well, the quantum adversary deals, yes, as a matter of fact, the quantum adversary still deals with this part. Right. But which I is okay. We envision those. Underlying assumptions. But, but, but I, I guess my point is they're, they're just like it wasn't envisioned to have this network or concurrent adversary 20 years ago, we can't see the oh, absolutely. 20 years Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. And that's why, uh, by, by the way, this is what you do is, with medicines over time. You know, you. you do clinical trials with variations of various compounds. Clearly, I mean, there is, there is no, there is no uh, implication in this talk that there is a formal system of conducting these clinical trials. But what I'm trying to say is that we have to broaden the scope of practical adversary definitions, and we should not rely only on Moore's law and this doubling laws in time. We should we should look at other laws which will enable us to construct effective adversaries. And of course, by the way, these are subsets of the polynomially bounded adversaries, so we don't mess around with the theory in that sense. So that's, uh, the, that definition of the adversary is still fine. We are changing the strategies. Yeah? So with the detection method at the end, the, the like, like my space and things like this, are you making the assumption that there No, no, I'm making, I'm, well, the only assumption I'm making is that they use the same protocol that uses um, the same encryption mode. And that's a very reasonable assumption, by the way. I mean, look, for example, at SSL. You yeah, know, they could be changing their keys, and you'll still be able to Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Them, in, fact, in fact, we want them to change their keys, right? Because we want the, the headers or the protocol constants to be encrypted in different keys. We really want them to change their keys. The, the more, the better. I'm, I'm, I'm unclear as to exactly how uh, an adversary, a practical adversary, would apply something like Metcalfe's law. Um, would, it, would a practical adversary have to have planted agents on some fraction of all users of, of, uh, of MySpace? Yeah, well, in fact, what they would do, they would do this. Let me just get the two things. But one, the first example, I mean, it would be this. They would use Akamai. <laughs> they would tap Akamai connections because supposedly Akamai gets 10 to 20 percent of all web traffic. And you only need 10 percent or less of, of, of the traffic over a period of time. Right. And, and is, so that, is that practical in the real world? I mean, well, what, um, if, if, if I were you know, funded by the Israeli Secret Service or whatever, uh, could I... Uh, could I have a reasonable chance of, of tapping that? Well, you don't have to go to the Israeli Secret Service. You don't even have to go to, to U.S. Secret Services. You just have to construct uh, a system that would uh, cost, say, in 2012, between 100,000 and 4 million. Basically, the cost here, uh, and I, I was very sneaky here, by the way, I assumed something which is very interesting nowadays. The marginal cost of computation in the internet is essentially zero. Marginal cost of encryption, right? So these unwitting uh, uh, encryptors, the oracles that we have here, for me as an adversary, they cost zero. They do they do the encryption in their normal uh, business. So uh, you know we don't have to invest anything. So basically, what you are investing here, you are investing in memory and you are investing in communication because you have to retrieve these massive volumes of data. But what's interesting about it, you don't have to do it in one day. You can do it over time. The, the theory results tell you these results hold forever. We prove them. When in fact what this shows is that these results in practice degrade in time. As time goes on, I collect more and more. I don't have to collect everything at once. But I know after I did a collection, maybe in one year or a year and a half, I know that I'll have a hit of some key, as it was pointed out, some probability. 
So that's something else that theory doesn't tell you, that encryption schemes and cryptographic protocols degrade in time. And this is an example to show how they do degrade in time. Yeah. So do you have concrete advice that you could give to, uh, to NISD that would allow them to make recommendations that you think would hold up over time? Because, of course, if you are constantly changing the rules, uh, how can you um, claim to make any interesting uh, so my, my recommendations? Yeah, my conclusion of recommendations was the one that I also mentioned the, as a result of the previous questions. First, you actually have to uh, start defining practical adversaries that go beyond the ones that we envision so far, namely worse law doubling effects. We have to go to other laws that capture the evolution of technology because that's how they do it, by the way. And uh, NIST does that and NSA does that as well. Uh, they look at the evolution of technology and they are extremely well informed. Um, and they make projections based on this. And so far, the projections have been exclusively based on the computational power of the adversary. And if you look at what cryptographers like Rodney Best and Matt Blaze and so on recommended in the past, they're all, all those recommendations are based on the computational power. But I'm suggesting that that should still go on. But in addition to that, we look at the execution models of these attacks uh, in the internet because the internet changed effectively our computational models. Not in terms of power, but in terms of the execution strategy. And the two classes that I identified that they could play with are these network adversaries, uh, or otherwise abbreviated as n-squared attacks, uh, or concurrent adversaries, otherwise abbreviated as n so, so that would be a place to start. Of course, I don't know all the tricks that, that a clever adversary can perpetrate. And my, my concern here is more uh, about this gap between the theory of practice than whether this attack would take six months or one year or a year and a half. I, I just want to alert people that, that this gap exists and will exist forever and we shouldn't blame each other for failures. <laughs> theorists should not blame implementers, and implementers should not blame theorists. Instead, we should sort of look at the fragility of, of these adversary models in practice. Okay, thank you again.